Good afternoon, everyone. That's great. I like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> It's a real pleasure uh, to welcome you to the 11th annual 7 Under 30 Speaker Series. I'm Susan Fiorito. I'm the Dean of the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship, and I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you. Before we get going, I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us today. Uh, we're so proud to present this group of innovators and particularly delighted that they are all FSU graduates <laughs> from five different colleges. College of Fine Arts, Social Science and Public Policy, Business, Arts and Sciences, and our very own Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship. Uh, yes, that deserves a hand. Okay. <laughs> Um, which shows really the commitment and dedication of Florida State University to the growing entrepreneurial ecosystem across campus. The first 7 Under 30 event was started by the Jim Moran Institute in 2012 by Dr. Randy Blass with input of students interested in entrepreneurship. It's so great to see that this program continues to grow and bring back wonderful alums. It's really one of my favorite events of the year. We know that although virtually every profession demands a certain level of entrepreneurial thinking, very few students actually gain entrepreneurial training and experience before they graduate. Whether you dream of starting a business, a tech company, a social enterprise, a nutrition business, or apparel boutique, the college, the Jim Moran College will inspire and prepare you uh, by providing a very rich curriculum in both entrepreneurship uh, majors and minors, an environment that promotes entrepreneurial thinking, hands-on learning, and real experience through business mentoring, networking, and internships. Our goal here in the Jim Moran College is to give all students the opportunity to learn fundamental business practices that will enhance their career potential and show students at Florida State what is possible in entrepreneurship after graduation. We believe students benefit greatly from hearing from young entrepreneurs like the one you're going to be here, the ones you're going to be hearing from today. I know you are eager to hear from this amazing group, so to move along, I would like to thank Wendy Plant, um, the director of the Center of Student Engagement, Caitlin Simpson, who is working still somewhere behind the scenes, uh, program manager for the Center of Student Engagement for organizing this great event. Wendy and Caitlin are responsible for the day-to-day -day development and management of student activities outside the classroom. These include business plan competitions, events sponsored by the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship, and so many other things that benefit the whole university. I hope you will make an effort to get to know Wendy and Caitlin and um, all of our speakers here today. So please help me welcome Wendy Plant. Thank you, Susan. So good afternoon, everyone. We have a wonderful group of speakers, and um, I know I'm very excited. I'm glad you're here to hear them um, in person. It's nice. We do also have this live stream, so welcome to our uh, those of you who are watching us on YouTube. But it's, it's a pleasure to be able to have so many of you here in the event space. So first, I'd like to be sure to thank Caitlin again, as uh, Susan did, because we wouldn't be doing this without her. Rosie Lopez keeps all the IT, AV working, and without her, <clears throat> I wouldn't be speaking. You wouldn't hear me. <laughs> Kirsten Franzen, Kaylee Blanchard, Ashley Marsh. 
And Lisa, I'm not sure where Lisa is, but there she is. Okay, thank you. She makes sure we get all our bills paid so we can keep the power on. Thank you for that. So all the staff, Rylan Brown, um, organizing all the volunteers um, from the Jim Rand College. So help you. thank you so much for helping arrange the event today. So we're also very excited to announce that we've joined a network of more than 45 top entrepreneurship programs around the United States and Ireland to launch the Blackstone Launchpad. The black, there's a um, pull up banner over there that has some bullet points about what it does, but it's the Blackstone Foundation supports entrepreneurial skill building and resources such as mentoring networks, competitions, learning tools, and events to assist beginning and experienced student entrepreneurs in learning about entrepreneurship and starting and growing new enterprises on college and university campuses. These programs engage a broad and diverse population of students to increase access to entrepreneurship resources and economic opportunity. Our new Blackstone program coordinator is our MC for today, Morgan Rogers. So um, you might remember, those of you that were here last year might remember Morgan was a speaker at 7 Under 30 last year, as she is the founder and CEO of Cool Silk, which is a luxury sleepwear brand. She's a two-time graduate of the Jim Moran College with an undergraduate degree in retail merchandising and product development and a master's degree in textiles and apparel entrepreneurship. You can find Morgan on campus in the home of the Blackstone Launchpad in the Jim Rand College of Entrepreneurship Shaw Building on campus. So Morgan, thank you for being here and for leading this group. Thank you, Thank you Wendy. Um, we will go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Dubois Akeem. Dubois Akeen is a proud husband and father, an accomplished choreographer, producer, published author, filmmaker. Since 2018, Dubois has worked as a writer, producer, and director of Untold Productions. He is the CEO and creative director of Akeen Brand, executive director of Harlem-based nonprofit Cross Creek NYC, founder of The Tuesday Thing, a global net that works made up of creatives, artists, entrepreneurs, and young business owners from around the globe, a partner with Calling All Creators, an open source creative agency, and digital innovative platform rooted in circular and creator economies, where he serves as director of programs and partnerships, working with brands such as Nike, Adidas, Super Digital, and Allbirds. Additionally, Dubois is signed to UIA Talent Agency as an opera director, writer, producer, and choreographer. He has served on faculty at prestigious New York University as a professor of dance teaching, contemporary technique, and lecturing on entrepreneurship, the work of art, and DEIB in dance. His teaching resume extends beyond NYU having worked as a guest artist, educator, lecturer in numerous colleges and university, a Georgia native and two-time alum of FSU, having earned a BFA in dance and Master of Science in Entrepreneurship focused on social and sustainable enterprise from the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship. Akeem began his professional career in NYC, primarily working as a dance artist, singer, and choreographer touring, performing as the only male company member of the Bessie Award, the award-winning Urban Bush Women Dance Company, founded by MacArthur Genesis, fellow Jaoule Zalar. Aside from performing with UBW, during his tenure with the company, Dwight also served as a branding and marketing strategist. In 2019, he transitioned to expand his work and began to work with several companies as an executive consultant, branding strategist, and DEIB expert. When he is not working, Dubois enjoys the beach, reading, and ministry, faith and service, faith and service, and are at his core. As a graduate of the STS Bible Institute and now worship pastor of Cultivate NYC, he has served as a worship leader, music director, and creative consultant for the past 10 years of ministries nationwide. 
Dwight looks forward to continued growth and fulfillment of his God-given purpose nationally alongside his beautiful wife, Camry Vanier, a king and daughter. Dwight King. Hello, hello. How are you all? How are you all? All right. I like to talk back to people. I'm from the South. Uh, it's such a pleasure, a pleasure to be here with you. It's such an honor to, uh, as, a, as a product of the Jim Moran School, to be returning in this way. Um, I, as they said, um, am the first graduate of the first cohort of the Social and Sustainable Enterprises major for a master's degree, so I feel very proud of that, as well as very humbled to be here for this 7 Under 30 um, select group of founders and, and entrepreneurs and creatives. These folks are absolutely brilliant. We were able to have dinner the other night and just hearing their stories and what they're building, what they're doing, um, I was so inspired and so humbled to be selected. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you to the faculty of the Jim Moran College, the larger FSU faculty, to the students and those who are streaming live. What's up to my family? Um, I love you all, thank you so much. Um, I'm Dubois Akeen, the CEO of Akeen Brand, uh, a modern creative agency and production company. As they stated, I am the husband of Camry Akeen, who is perfect and brilliant, um, and the, the founder, the original founder of Akeen Brand. Um, so you'll hear about her a little bit more. And then Kai Bella Akeen, my daughter, the heir to the throne. Um, she, she is an absolute legend. Um, today, I want to talk to you um, about becoming a keen thinker. There are a, a lot of different things you can do in life. There are a lot of different ways you can matriculate on your journey. I want to talk to you about becoming a keen thinker. I only have seven minutes, which is stressful. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else get stressed out about time? Okay, that's me. I only have seven minutes, so I'm gonna try to impart or download to you seven keen thoughts, seven principles, seven ideas, perhaps, that can help you on your journey as a potential entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a doctor, lawyer. I think that these principles are transferable. They're not um, specific to entrepreneurship, but they can uh, help you be catalytic toward a positive end, no matter what, where life takes you. So these seven principles um, we'll share today. I want to start by defining keen. Our good friend Webster has done the light work for us. Keen is defined as pointed, clear, sharp, acute, perceptive, powerful, piercing, discerning, refined. I want you to become a clear, pointed, sharp, acute, perceptive, powerful, powerful, discerning, refined thinker. Because if you can think it, you can be it, you can live it, you can create it. That's the principle of our Cain brand. The, first, the, the full seven principles, I'll go over them and then we'll, we'll, we'll track backward. One, make people... Make people's well-being a priority. Principle number one, make people's well-being a priority. Point two, study the greats. Point three, become and be a net, a net that actually works. Four, pause and pivot when needed. Five, don't miss your moment, stay ready. Six, you can always be better, you can always do more. Don't stop short of great. Seven, never underestimate your point of view and perspective. Point one, Make people's well-being a priority. Uh, my wife started Icane Brand, frankly, because we needed uh, money. Uh, we live in New York City, and uh, I was a touring artist. She was working in the fashion industry. I'm going to loosen up a little bit because I'm a little tight. It's okay. It's the nerves, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, she started Icane Brand because we need to make money. You know, I was a touring artist. She was working in the fashion industry. It's the most expensive city in the world. Um, and so she started um, doing custom design work. She's a scientist by trade. She works for the Langone Lab at NYU now and does research at Columbia, but she's also a fashion designer. So she started doing this um, custom design work. Um, and then eventually things evolved and we started consulting brands and doing all this other stuff with Ikeen Brand. Um, and we started to really tap into our niche when we realized that our most attractive asset, the, the leveraging point, the value proposition that we were able to bring to the table was helping people people grow their ideas. 
from inception to fruition, helping them discover how do you take this thing you've been dreaming about and make it a reality so that it adds value to the marketplace. That small shift was catalytic in helping us propel uh, into the spaces that we're now in, working with Nike and Adidas and, and Allbirds and these other spaces. Just simply shifting to, oh man, we need to make money and survive in New York to, no, let's help other people do well. And as we help other people do well, we'll attract more people to help them do well. And, and that's just been the journey. So make people's well-being a priority. Be motivated, another way to say that is, be motivated by your ability to champion others. Point two, study the greats. Someone else has done the light work, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Study the greats, see what other people have done successfully and follow that trajectory. Point three, build and become a net that actually works. This old model of networking, you get my card, I take your card, you, we exchange emails. It's not so effective. I think there's some value there for sure, but become and build a net that actually works. They talked about the Tuesday thing in my bio. The Tuesday thing is a community that we created that's, a, I guess, a, an arm of a Keen brand to help other creatives have a community that they could collaborate with. Really thinking in this idea of circular economy before we had that cool language, we were, we were working in that way. So I think find the people who are around you doing things that inspire you and work across with them. Build a net that actually works. Pause and pivot when needed. As a early company, we were getting some traction. We got this huge client and we weren't ready for it. We didn't have the infrastructure to support that. And so we had to pause and pivot as needed. Don't be afraid to do that. No matter how successful and how, how shameful it can be when, when a hard task is put in front of you and you fail at it, don't be afraid to pause and pivot. Um, don't miss your moment, stay ready. Make sure that you're doing the work to, even in the pause and pivot if you have to do that, make sure you're doing the work to stay ready if an opportunity comes that you need to take care of. A couple more and then, and then I'll wrap because my time is at 11 seconds. Um, you can always be better, you can always do more. In 2019, my wife and I published a book called Think, I Am Whatever I Think. Think it, be it, live it, think. I am whatever I think. My opening statement in the book, my, my author statement is you can always be better, you can always do more. If we republish it in another edition, the thing that I would add is don't stop short of great. There's always more, no matter what you're doing, no matter how many successes you've experienced. I've, I've performed on the Apollo stage, Lincoln Center, these places, but I can always be better, I can all do, always do more. Finally, never underestimate your point of view and your perspective. There's something that you have that no one else has, and don't let anyone dial that back or make you feel um, inadequate with that. Bring that forward, because that's gonna help you enter the rooms you wanna be in. So thank you all so much, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Next, we're gonna have Ravi Abuvalo. Ravi Abuvalo is the founder of Scaling with Systems, a growth agency that builds profitable client acquisition systems through paid advertising and sales funnels for their clients, helping them reach exponential month-over-month -month growth. He's worked with over 2,100 six-, seven-, and eight-figure businesses, business owners from around the world, including Fortune 1000 CEOs, celebrities from the Shark Tank, and numerous industry leaders. Ravi spends his free time flying his plane around the United States. Ravi Abuvalo. All right. All right, I only have seven minutes, like Dubois said there a second ago, so if everyone could please stand up for just one moment for me. Thank you very much. This is being recorded, just so everybody knows. I do put out a lot of content. One of the things I'm gonna be talking about here in a moment. So what I need you to do is I'm gonna walk back on stage here and I want you to just go nuts when I, when I count down from three, okay? Just like you guys have been waiting to hear me all day long and I'm gonna repurpose that later and make it look like I'm more important than I am, okay? So <laughs> let me walk back over here. I'm gonna count from three, two, one and you guys are gonna go nuts. Everyone's listening, you ready? Three, two, one, let's hear it. All right, yeah! Please, please, thank you guys. Thank you, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Thank you guys very much. Just wanted to liven up the energy a little bit. I appreciate you guys being my test dummies here. Not dummies in the actual sense, but you guys know what I mean. Uh, my name is Ravi Vala, like I said. Um, big shout out to everybody who put this together. Uh, thank you, Miss Wendy, for um, hosting me here. 
incredibly honored. One of my bucket list things was always to come back to Florida State and speak um, to some students. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. I graduated in 2012, which seems like a, or 2016, which seems like an eternity ago for a lot of people here. Um, but I'm grateful to be here. Today I'm gonna talk about three main things. Um, and I wanna try to give you guys something valuable to leave with. That's, I don't wanna talk too high level. I wanna give you guys something you can write down and go home with. It, who here is thinking of starting a business or has a business, wants to go on entrepreneurship? Yeah, just one? Come on guys, we're in the school of entrepreneurship here, okay. So I'm gonna cover three main things that I wish that I knew. Um, like they said before, I have had the pleasure of working with around uh, 2,200 businesses in the last three years, and every single one of them was essentially helping them grow and scale to the next level. So we've helped people go from zero to one million, one to 10 million, and even 10 to 120 million. So um, I've seen kind of all of the different spectrums, and so I wanna to talk to you about three main lessons that I've learned there, and I have five minutes. So, uh, number one, the first thing I wanna tell you guys is as you are thinking about joining the entrepreneurship journey, is to define what you actually want. Um, I will tell you that I have made um, a, my first million dollar year, then my first million dollar month, then my first million dollar day, and none of it brought me any more happiness uh, than when I first made my first thousand dollars online in paid advertising. And what the big lesson that I learned there, which I wish I knew so much earlier because I had delayed so much you know, satisfaction in my life, was that I never really defined what the end result I wanted was. Um, and Dubois talked about thinking, right? Um, and so one of the, request that I have from you is I have a document on my computer, a Google document, uh, it just says Rabi Uvala. And I literally wrote out what I want my future to look like in five to 10 years. I wrote out the person that I'm with, what kind of car I drive, what kind of house I have. Um, I have, well, you know, I, like they said, I have a plane, so what kind of plane I'm also flying as well, who I'm surrounded with, what kind of person that I am. And what I realized was that I kept on delaying a lot of things that I wanted in my life for later on because I was like, oh, I'll do that when I get this thing, when I have this amount of money, when this thing happens. And when, when I actually wrote it all out, I realized that I can achieve these things a lot sooner than I thought. And it's kind of funny because most of us just want more, more, more. I had always wanted more and more and more until I defined what I wanted. And then it became very easy to say no to everything that was outside of that. So it's very rare for me to ever say yes to something because now I know exactly what I want out of life and so if it doesn't fall in that spectrum, I just say no to it. And that has brought me a lot of happiness and it has allowed me to achieve things that I thought would take five to 10 years from now, I can achieve a lot sooner. Uh, the second thing is what I talked about jokingly earlier around content. So attention, currency, that is what it is today. Your ability to capture other people's attention will determine your success in business. There's no more, if you build it, they will come. I promise you that. If you have seen um, Kylie Jenner or The Rock just created a tequila brand, um, if you see some of these influencers out there, what you've realized is they actually, at least in my opinion, sometimes don't have the best business or the best product or the best service, but they have an ability to capture attention. And so depending on what you're optimizing for, but I'm imagining many people here are optimizing for more money, and obviously more impact. If that is something that you're optimizing for, the first thing I'd recommend, especially if you are thinking of starting a business and maybe even if you're younger, you're still in college, something I wish I started a while ago, is to start building a brand and to start creating content online. A lot of people think that they have to know what they wanna do first and then they build the brand around it, but you can look at um, Mr. Beast or some of the other largest influencers online. They captured the audience first and then they said, great, I have this audience of thousands, millions, or hundreds of millions of people, what should I sell them? It is much easier to do that than it is to create the business and then try to find the audience afterwards. But the truth is, is to find and create a great audience takes a lot of time. That's why most businesses you see on TikTok or Instagram, something like that, they're willing to just pay someone $50,000 for them to make a post, it's because that person has spent all that time and energy creating that audience and they simply wanna leverage that audience for one post to drive business to their own company. So you can be that person that they pay $50,000 to. But the secret of that is you have to start doing that now. Uh, there's obviously hundreds of channels out there you guys can choose from. I was speaking earlier on today, uh, and I'll just touch on my favorite one, which is YouTube. It's the number two search en engine of the world, owned by the number one search engine of the world, and you can create long-form content that stays on there for eternity, right? So I rank for a lot of keywords uh, that are around my business, and I started the videos three years ago. I have around 40,000 subscribers, but it is the main driver of business for our, one of our eight-figure companies. And if I had started that even two years before I did, my business would probably be three to five times what it is right now. Once again, it depends on what you're uh, prioritizing for, what you're indexing for, but if you are trying to have more impact and make more money, 
capturing attention is gonna be the first one of those things. And the second thing is gonna be your offer. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much into it because I only have a minute and 13 seconds left. But one thing I did wish that I had paid attention to more in the very beginning was what I was gonna bring to the world. So we've talked about defining what you want, we've talked about capturing attention and eyeballs, and the final step of it is of course, selling to those eyeballs. What are you gonna give those people? And I'm not gonna go too deep into it here, but what I would challenge a lot of you guys to think is, we're obviously entering a recession right now. Uh, you have the economy going up, down, left, right. So we have to start thinking, you all can offer anything you want to to anybody, right? You can literally sell somebody uh, something on the side of the road. You can sell something on an online service. You can sell, create a SaaS company if you want. So start to pay a little bit more attention to what is the thing that you're gonna decide to sell to other people. I myself chose a path around helping other people make more money. Because when I was able to help other people make more money, I knew that I could make more money. One secret that I learned very early on is that if I make you $100,000 out of thin air, then you're probably not too upset to give me a portion of that, right? Versus the opposite, which is what I typically see with businesses or people that are starting businesses. Online service-based businesses, especially if you are just thinking of starting out, are unbelievable. Advertising agencies, SEO companies, you can go up to somebody without any idea of what you're doing, this is what I did, and told them that you could run ads for them, they pay you $3,000, and then you YouTube, how do you run ads? And you've just made $3,000. And it's funny how that works out and we're all kind of joking about it, but in reality, um, it has very low capital expenditure to create a business like that and you can, that's exactly how I got started. And then over time you can learn more, pay employees, remove yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So spend a little bit of time thinking, all right, if the world goes to you know what, what are things that people are still gonna be buying that I can still be selling? So I hope you guys enjoyed everything. Thank you so much for your time and you guys have a blessed day, thank you. They told us like 15 times I need to do this, and I forgot. Sorry. I'm going to introduce Array Comier. Fashion has always been a passion of Array since a very young age. He started selling candy bars in middle school and saving up the profits to purchase exclusive clothes and shoes that would solidify him as the best dressed individual in school. He was determined to stand out no matter the occasion. From attending school, running his daily errands, or hanging out with friends on the weekend, he wanted to have on clothing that would be remembered. After graduating with two bachelor's degrees from Florida State University, one in management and marketing, and playing football for FSU through the years of 2015 and 2019, he did not want to start a career that he was not passionate about. Therefore, Array took tailoring classes after graduation and instantly fell in love with custom suiting. He loved how it made him feel. It felt similar to dressing up as Superman. When people would see him walking the streets, they gave him more respect and always complimented him on how well he dressed. That's when it was obvious he could turn those superior feelings that he felt within himself into a business that would make others feel those same emotions. This is how Array Comir Custom Clothing was born in 2019. Let's welcome Array. Hello, everyone. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Thank you for having me. What a great honor for me to be here. Um, so first things first, uh, I want to say, hey, it's my mom on live stream. I spent four years, and now I sell suits for a living. Thank you. Um, but the biggest thing for my business is that um, what, I, what I want to give to people, I want you to, to imagine yourself when you got that gift for a holiday or your parents or how you felt when that new package came in, you wore that shirt, the feeling of you um, how you felt on the inside or wanted to be protected as, that's what I want to give to other people. Um, I'm giving people the opportunity to feel important, feel empowered, feel like they're like the newest Superman that's on the block. So with my brand, that's kind of how I, um, I, I built it. I want everyone to feel unique, special, um, important. So with those being said, when I started at Ray Comir, um, my biggest thing I wanted to do is make sure everyone has a priority. Everyone in the world here is built uniquely. Everyone's shaped differently. Every, everyone has longer legs or what, what have you. My items are custom made for all of my clients. So everything you make or everything you have is always gonna be a one of one, of course. Um, secondly, I wanna give you an opportunity to always look your best. Look better, I, say, I call it like 
the peacock syndrome. Like, just look fun to, like, uh, look amazing to where everyone's like, hey, I don't know that guy, but I want to know that guy or that girl, of course. And then lastly, um, lastly right here, I want to be able to save everyone's time. You know, going to the store, going to the mall, finding parking, getting cut off in traffic. Those are pains that people would never love about life, never. So I'm able to come to their, their home, their office, and things of nature to kind of save them time and I bring the store to their coffee table, to their living room, or sometimes I did one in a Starbucks parking lot, but <laughs> I sell convenience. So the biggest thing that here with my business, I want to be able to leave these gems. To give you the, the ugly truth about entrepreneurship that I think sometimes our Instagram influencers try to sweep under the rug, like they don't exist. Like, hey, you, you start a business, you get a Lambo. You start a business, you get a condo. That's not how it is in the beginning. Um, I think I want to be able to give all of our inspiring entrepreneurs in the crowd, which I'm pretty sure you guys are in this building, are somewhat, some form, or they have a business, or think about starting one when you finish school. I want to be able to say, hey, believe in yourself. As cliche as that sounds, I mean, I know it sounds pretty cliche, but that's one of the biggest components of being an entrepreneur, just believing in yourself, because when you start your business, the friends, the family, people around you that are not have interest of you being successful will doubt you. They will project what their shortcomings are onto you. So it needs to, everything that you have in your life is all between the ears. So always believe in yourself here. Secondly, Consistency kills the cat. If you continue to just wake up, do the dirty work, put in that time, grind in and grind out, you can have 99 no's, but that 100, that, that, that 100 decision, that one yes can change your entire life forever. So always put in that consistency in whatever you do. And then lastly, um, what I want to always uh, explain to all of my, you know, fellow entrepreneurs like myself, see a little, you see a lot. You see a lot, you see nothing. So what that means is entrepreneurship, you're, you're first in the game. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna sell suits, I wanna sell shoes, I wanna sell apparel, bow ties, you name it. Putting all of your energy in different baskets at different times sometimes slows down the process that will either take you one year, but takes that one process and makes it now, it takes five years. So pick one business of what your, what your program or your business you want, dive into that one tunnel of your, of your business, and then once that one has its full, its full four legs, then dive into the other portion of the business. If you can outsource or uh, delegate tasks to others in your, in your business, that makes it even better. So that's kind of one of my um, brief and understands that I wanted to talk about here at um, 730. I've been extremely honored and blessed to be here. And thank you for attending. All right. Sean Hall is the founder and CEO of Wellius, maker of the cleanest and tastiest plant-based protein powder that exists, and a company on a mission to build a healthier, happier world. Sean started his official entrepreneurial journey right when he graduated FSU in the summer of 2014. Prior to Wellius, he is the co-founder of Fit Living, which makes fresh protein bars, and then founder of TOFM Media, which operates a portfolio of digital publications around food and wellness. Sean currently resides in Orlando, where he lives and breathes the creative challenge of growing his startups and bringing his customers real value. When not building businesses, Sean has written a novel, writes and records original music, loves sports, surfing, and all things outdoors, and deeply values time spent with his friends and family. Sean Hall. Hi there. I'm Sean. Thanks so much for being here and for having me. Um, yeah, I don't think I've given a public speech since my public speaking class here at Florida State, which I put off to my very last semester of senior year, um, probably in hopes that it wouldn't be required anymore. 
I thought, when will I ever need to give a speech in my real life? But FSU knew best, because here I am. Um, yeah, I want to start by thanking the Jay Moran College and the amazing staff uh, for having me for this honor. I want to thank my family and loved ones uh, who have unconditionally supported my entire journey. I think uh, loving an entrepreneur can be harder than being an entrepreneur at times. So um, my deepest gratitude to them always. Um, yeah, these days my job is being the founder of Wellius, which is a company that I launched last year that makes a really incredible plant-based protein powder. Um, I'll get more into that, but my journey actually started long before that. So eight, nearly eight years ago, I started my first company, which is a different packaged food company, a fresh food packaged food um, that I started with a good friend. And we started with no money and no mentors and no experience and really the mindset of um, let's go for this and if it fails horribly, you know, we'll, we'll gain more practical experience than any entry level job will bestow upon us. Um, but yeah, it went well. and. We turned into a great little company in the first couple of years, and um, ultimately we got kind of busy with other side projects, so we just made it as efficient as possible and ran it as a small profitable company for the last seven years, and we're actually in the process of selling it now. Um, and then a couple of years into that, I started a side project which would turn into my second company. Um, I started a website called The Online Farmer's Market, and the idea was to curate all these better for you food and beverage brands and craft products. And it would become a discovery platform that people could come on, learn about the products, um, and then click over to the websites of those brands directly and support them directly. So it became a great marketing funnel for all these brands. We grew a really big online audience from that. So we evolved into this digital publisher that did all kinds of article content and recipe content and a bunch of digital content. And now we run a portfolio of content brands around food and wellness that reach 100 million plus people organically every year. Um, and that brings me to early January 2021. Unfortunately, the first few months of that year, I had some personal health stuff come up and I was really struggling with it. And it just made me more like health and wellness conscious than ever before in my life. And that happened to coincide with running out of protein powder, which is a product I've used for forever. And when I went to buy more, um, I turned it over to make sure there weren't any ingredients I was trying to avoid, and I realized all the ingredients I was trying to avoid were right there. Um, and I realized that 99% of protein powders are just filled with these horrible ingredients. And it really upset me because I know being in the food space, like we're trying to make better for you junk food and snack food and dessert foods, but at the same time, the health products that we're using, that we're all using when, with the intention of being healthy and the assumption that they're healthy, are actually filled with the same like horrible ingredients that plague the junk food industry. So it seemed like a problem worth solving. I got to work and I created Wellius, um, which is a really great product, 100% plant-based protein powder. Um, it really is the, the cleanest ingredient list just for real food ingredients. Um, and the taste and texture is amazing. But the coolest thing has been how many customers have reached out and said it's the first protein powder after trying dozens that doesn't like upset their stomach or give them bloating or cramps. Um, and so giving access to people to a product that actually makes them feel a little better on a daily basis is really the coolest thing for me, cooler than any financial benefits or arbitrary accolades or anything. So. Um, but we've done really well in a short amount of time. We've gained thousands of customers, and we have um, gotten product, got to send product to celebrities and gotten a lot of media coverage and um, been a bestseller on Amazon and all this cool stuff. Um, but uh, honestly, that like success to speed ratio that's happened has been due to the all the experience I had prior. It was the seven years prior with uh, just my head down, living and breathing entrepreneurship and trying to become a great entrepreneur. And I've, that's always been the goal and I have a long way to go, but it's like being great at anything. It's definitely like your passion and talent, but combined with a lot of hard work and consistency. Um, and a lot of the founders I see winning uh, at a high level, it's their third, fourth, fifth business. Um, and so it's definitely a long road of resilience, but it's definitely worth it. Um, a couple pieces of advice, just like things that I've been thinking about broadly. One is whatever your, whatever your goal is, whatever your business idea, whatever your dream really, um, you're 100% capable. It's 100% possible. Um, I think like do not waste time seeking validation from friends and peers and, and family and um, you know society when you know in your gut that there's something you really want to do and really want to try. Uh, I promise if you work intentionally at something for 
50 hours a week for the next 12 years, you will accomplish it in some capacity. You might not be the outlier like billionaire situation, but you could be really successful at something that you're actually passionate about. At the same time, it will be extremely hard. There will be all the highs and lows and feelings of insecurity and rejection and failure and perceived risk and all of that stuff. Um, but it should be hard. Like you should embrace that difficulty um, because you're trying to do something that most people just see as like a dream career. Um, I think the good news is, is just to be like an adult in this world, you're probably gonna work 40 hours a week for the next 50 years of your life at something. And so I think it should be towards something that really fires you up and you care about. Um, but that's really all I have. I, I appreciate everyone being here and I hope the next great entrepreneurs are in this room and to my fellow nominees, they're super inspiring and excited to hear the rest of them speak. Thank you. Lauren Seymour is the co-owner of Lobo's Boutique right here in Tallahassee, Florida. She is 25 years old and a Tallahassee native. Growing up in Tallahassee, Lauren had always dreamed of going to Florida State. She graduated from FSU in 2019 with a degree in retail merchandising and product development with a minor in business. After graduation, she spent two years gaining hands-on experience in the retail world and knew that that's where she wanted to be. Since high school, she knew she wanted to open her own boutique, and in 2021, she got the chance to make her dream a reality. Lauren opened Lobo's Boutique with her mom in July of 2021, and they have hit the ground running, getting to live her dream every single day. Lauren Seymour. Hi, guys. My name is Lauren Seymour, and I'm the co-founder and co-owner of Lobo's Boutique. We are a women's boutique located here in Tallahassee, Florida, in Bannerman Crossing on the north side of town. We just celebrated our one year anniversary in August and it has been the best experience. So I graduated from Florida State in 2019 with a degree in retail merchandising and product development. And if you had asked me then if I would be standing here today, I would have told you, heck no, there was no way. And that's not because I didn't want to open my own store that had always been a dream of mine since I was in high school. I just kind of thought I had to play it safe. I thought I had to have X, Y, Z in line before I jumped. I thought I had to have, you know, be in this stage of life or whatever it was. I just never saw myself starting so young. And that is not at all how my journey went. So a little over, probably a year and a half ago, I found out that the building that we're currently in today was becoming available. And it was my dream location, exactly where I wanted to be in Tallahassee. I knew I wanted to have a brick and mortar store because that small town feel in Tallahassee is amazing. I wanted to make those connections with people, but I also wanted to go online as well because online is taking over as we know. So it was gonna be a lot of work. And I went to go tell my family that like, I think this is it, I think this is my chance. I know it's crazy because we are not planning to do this, but I think this is too good of an opportunity to pass up on. And my mom at that point was at a point that she could pivot her career and she was like, I will do it with you. And I was like, all right. So we had a week to figure out if we were gonna sign this lease or not. And we decided to sign the lease. And there was probably a hundred logical reasons we could have said no, but it was just too good of an opportunity to pass up on. And then after we signed the lease, we opened our store within a month, which we had nothing prepared, nothing ready, no logo, no website, no nothing. So if anybody needs a crash course on how to open a store in a month, I'm your girl. Um, there have definitely been a lot of ups and downs throughout this year, but it has been such a good experience for us. And there are three main things that I wanna share with y'all today. So. Everybody tells you it's gonna be hard. Everybody tells you there's gonna be bad days. And yes, that is true, but it's okay. Everybody else that is in the entrepreneurship world is having those days as well. It's normal. It's nothing to freak out about. You need to remain calm. And it's really what you do with those days that is most important. So we're about to, currently we're in our busy season. It's about to be holiday season. And then January is gonna roll around and it's gonna slow down drastically. Well, that's happening for everybody in the retail world. It's nothing to be scared about. But use those times that you're a little slower to pivot your mindset, create content, grow in other ways, reach other people. Don't just freak out because you're not making sales that day. There's something you can do with those days that is beneficial in other ways. The second thing I wanted to share with y'all 
is I know this is crazy because I wouldn't have believed it if someone told me, but you will not always be as young as you are today sitting in that seat. And what I mean by that is social media. Social media is becoming a huge, huge part of businesses. And when I graduated in 2019, Instagram was a thing. I had Instagram down. I could make a post, I could make a caption, people would see it, we're on our way. But when we opened our store is really when TikTok became popular. It's when Reels became popular. Instagram changed their whole algorithm and now nobody sees your post for whatever reason. And so there's gonna be a time when you have a new platform that comes along and you're not gonna know how to work it. And that is an eye-opening experience. I felt like a grandma making my first TikTok. It probably took me like two hours, but you know what? We got it out there, we got it posted. Now we have a TikTok, we have reels, but there will come a time in your life when you're not as young as you are today. And you need to be humble enough to learn from those younger than you because they have a lot of knowledge in other aspects of business that can help you tremendously. And the third thing I want to share with y'all is to just take that leap of faith, take that jump. You never know what might happen. If you're somebody like me and you think that you have to have all the puzzle pieces figured out, like you're not a risk taker, you need to have it together before you take that leap to start your business, I'm here to tell you, when you start your business, it will make you figure out those missing puzzle pieces. Since we've opened our store, we've become photographers, we've become graphic designers, we've become, you know, you're the community or the service people now. You do so much more than you even know. And if I had waited to have this, this, or that figured out in my mind, I probably would have never opened a business. And that can be... Just so important to know that when you jump in there, you're gonna be fine and you're gonna figure it out. And if you're sitting in this room today and you've gone through any of the programs at Florida State or you're sitting in this room today just willing to absorb knowledge and willing to learn, then you're gonna be fine. My degree at Florida State has helped me more than I could have ever imagined. And I'm so thankful that I went through this program, but just know you're always learning. You're always evolving. You're going to figure out how to make it work. And you probably have more people in your corner than you even know. You have people from home, people from college, your family. You have all these people show up for you that want you to be successful. And you're probably going to be fine. So the smartest thing you can do is believe in yourself, believe in your dream, and believe in your passion. And just jump and do it and see what happens. So thank y'all. My name is Lauren Seymour. Thank you. John Wilcox. Diagnosed with type 1 diabetes 17 years ago, John's career is driven by his personal connection to his own diabetes care. He began working in the field of, di of diabetes as a clinical endocrinology research associate, investigating topics related to the impact of insulin pump infusion, failure of glycemic management while at Florida State University. His academic experience includes leading funded research studies at Florida State University College of Medicine and Yale School of Medicine, with publications presented at national diabetes conferences, including the American Diabetes Association Scientific Sessions, the Children with Diabetes Conference, and the Diabetes Technology Meeting. John has also sat on the Avamed Diabetes Executive Leadership Group, working with other industry executives to increase Medicare and Medicaid coverage of emerging diabetes technology. He successfully co-founded Dietech Diabetes and has since led the company's overall operations and, found, and fundraising of a million in pre-seed capital, including 300,000 National Institutes of Health Phase I SBIR grant. He is also pursuing a Master's of Science in Diabetes Education and Management at Columbia University, NYC, and is an avid runner, having run the Boston Marathon of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. His research industry expertise and large network give John the necessary skills to lead Dietech Diabetes and build care technology for fellow people with diabetes. John Wilcox. Hey, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you so much um, for hosting me, I'm, or, or for hosting this, and uh, letting me come and speak. It's a, truly an honor. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, so um, great to reconnect with uh, you know, friends and faculty here at the university. Um, so uh, my story um, really just starts off as a senior here at Florida State University. So. 
Um, back in 2018, I graduated with uh, biology and chemistry here at FSU, um, having never taken a business class before. Um, and you know, we had the opportunity to pitch um, a product that we were building in the lab um, to the innovation challenge here. Um, and really, that event is what um, made us into a company. We literally had to form an entity to accept the prize uh, money. So the four of us, uh, three being biomedical engineers um, and myself being a um, biology major, um, kind of decided right after graduation, okay, so maybe we could just put off medical school and working at Johnson & Johnson for like a year and use this as a resume builder. Um, but that's not what happened at all. Um, we ended up uh, working full time for the company right after we graduated in um, ended up moving the company to uh, where it's at now in Tennessee, um, in Memphis, and have since uh, grown it to be about 10 team members and um, having raised venture funding um, as well as non-dilutive capital. So, um, you know, my connection to my company is, is very personal. As it was mentioned, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and I wear technology that we are able to work with, um, which is really, really amazing. And so that's kind of what my first word of advice is for um, you know, emerging entrepreneurs who are graduating is to really find your passion and your connection to your business. Um, it's very evident, at least in pitch competitions that we've gone to, um, or seeing companies um, get started with uh, founders who don't understand the core, um, you know, reason or mission of their problem. Um, and so being able to have that connection to your company is so critical uh, because it gets you through those times that other people have mentioned up here on stage. Uh, which can often be extremely difficult, whether it be people doubting you, um, you not hitting a fundraising goal. Um, you know, those are moments that can be, um, you can beat with, with that mission and that passion that you can have. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, going through the pandemic with a medical device startup was obviously extremely difficult. Um, you know, we had the opportunity to apply to some grant funding with a uh, entity that did not end up working out. And so we had to really pivot and reapply that uh, application to a new, um, a, new, a new place, which was the NIH. Um, and so that entire lesson that we had really taught us resilience. Um, and you know, as upcoming founders or founders now, um, you know, I really recommend to you all to just continually remember that the things that might end up not working out are, are truly lessons um, for you. Um, and you have to learn from them. And, you know, with things like you not getting a grant or maybe not getting a customer, you know, we have a list of, of, of feedback that we've given ourselves with our company about things that we did wrong and how we've learned about that. And I, I, I've turned to that. Um, oftentimes before I go on to a next opportunity just to remember, you know, what was it that may have not worked out and, and how can I improve for my next time? And so resilience truly is another lesson that we've learned with growing Diatech. Um, another thing is, of course, your network. Um, you know, you're not able to do everything by yourself. Um, and so when you are growing a business, obviously it's very important to turn to experts. And, and I see some of those here in sitting right here, you know, uh, whether it be, um, you know, expertise in, in other fields that you're not aware of um, or know what to do, um, turning to them who know what they're doing and allowing them to teach you and rely on their expertise to make sure that you can get through your, you know, your, your whatever hurdle that you're trying to go through. Um, that is that is so important because you can often waste time sometimes um, you're trying to figure out everything on your own um, and it is good for you to learn but if you're trying to move fast get a product out um, don't be afraid to ask for help um, that's a, and again another thing that I've learned uh, from from watching other entrepreneurs who um, can often sometimes be stubborn and we've been stubborn ourselves don't get me wrong I mean it it, it, it comes from our own, our own learnings too, but finding those mentors, um, you know, and locally here in Tallahassee, we have those. You know, here at this college, you have amazing faculty that you can turn to for help. Domi Station um, is an incredible resource here too. Um, and, you know, it, other entrepreneurs, whether it be in your class, I, I really uh, recommend you to utilize this, um, this, this uh, ecosystem, as we call it, because it is very, very helpful um, because that's what got us 
um, going was starting here in Tallahassee um, with those resources. Uh, the, the last uh, feedback that I have just with the time remaining really is um, just not being afraid of um, just the future. Um, and that's really kind of a, a very blanket statement. Um, but, you know, to talk personally, you know, I and still do have a passion. You know, I work in the STEM field. Um, I, I, was, I took my MCAT when I was also starting Diatech. I had plans of going to medical school. I'd still love to at some point if I'm able, but, um, you know, the, the plans that you might have moving forward with your company or your idea um, may not always work out. And again, you will face those challenges of worrying about what's going to happen in the future. And you know, if you surround yourself with these experts, you have the mentality of learning from your failures and you have the ability to be passionate about your business um, because you know it so well. Um, being afraid of that future is um, something that you can overcome and you can really see almost as an opportunity, the unknown, because you can, you know, you're not defined by anything. You are literally able to set your own path. So I think that's, you know, some wisdom I've learned, again, from amazing mentors, people here, this ecosystem. So um, if anyone's interested in learning about, you know, STEM or the pathway after uh, college, starting a business in that field or, you know, startup funding, um, I have a lot of resources too that I can put on uh, for you all if you're interested um, with your own company. So. Thank you very much. Rosalind Wilsey. With a passion for caffeine and a special place for coffee in her heart, Rosalind always knew she would someday have a career in coffee. This day came sooner than planned when the pandemic offered an opportunity to live out her caffeinated dreams. Growing up in an entrepreneurial spirited household and with an incredible support system, she knew one day she would have she knew one day she would want to have something to truly call her own. She watched her dad create his own restaurant, Daddio's, and was able to spend a plethora of time behind the scenes of a startup at a young age. She also watched her mom trailblaze and achieve an immense amount of accomplishments in her professional sales career. Rosalind was also a competitive athlete and knew how to set up a killer lemonade stand. It was safe to assume that the entrepreneurial spirit was in her blood. She grew up swigging sips from her mom's coffee at a young age. Then she insisted by age 11 that she was ready to carry her own tumbler of, cafe of caffeine to school. The coffee smelled and tasted like home and it allowed her to take it anywhere and everywhere. She found it inspiring that a homey cup of caffeine that could mean something so personal could also be such a universal experience, one that fills the hearts offers comfort and inspires brilliance. She would find herself going into every coffee shop she could, every chance she got. When she wasn't in a coffee shop, she and her mom loved experimenting with flavors and espressos at home and in their kitchen. Coffee is built in the grounds of love, passion, and community. And she knew that it was something that she would find a way somehow to pursue. And when opportunity knocked, well, she decided she was going to give it her best shot, a shot of espresso, that is. <laughs> Rosalind Wilsey. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Or as I usually approach a larger crowd, I always say good evening, my caffeinated friends. Um, it's an honor to be here today. I'm going to kind of take you on a journey on how this all got started and how we got to where we are now and hopefully give you some advice along the way. So we're gonna take it back to 2015 when I got accepted to Florida State University. So when I originally got to Florida State, I was actually gonna be a meteorology major. And that was very short-lived, two weeks to be exact, because um, someone came up to me and said, you know, a meteorology major, you have to double major in math and physics. And I said, oh no, oh no, no, I'm not good at either of those things. And so I immediately 
dropped it. And uh, I ended up doing exploratory uh, for a year after that. And it was kind of tough because I went to Florida State like very dead set on doing meteorology, not really doing much research behind that, but it was very niche and I didn't have a backup plan. So when I was kind of throwing that curveball, I had to figure out what I wanted to do and kind of quick, you know, I got four years is what I was told. So I had a friend that was actually in marketing and I kind of did a little more research. I was like, what, what is marketing? Like I, it's kind of an umbrella term. And I realized that it's like storytelling and brand telling and you get to communicate with these people and kind of tell your story to people and communicate and just connect. And it was something that I really like love to do and I ultimately decided that I wanted to pursue it. So in May of 2019, I did graduate from Florida State University with a marketing major and then also a minor in entrepreneurship because I had always wanted to start a business. I just didn't know when, where, or how quite yet. So after I graduated, I did take a sales job in Tampa, Florida. Also not very good at sales, but it was my first job offered to me and I was very excited about it. And Tampa is a cool place. I'm from Georgia, so I was like a beach. That sounds awesome. So I went to the beach <laughs> and did sales for a year, um, almost a year. And then we're gonna fast forward to March of 2020, as you all know, as the infamous COVID quarantine era. Mass layoffs around the world. I was part of it, directly impacted. My company was already known for mass layoffs and I was lucky to make it that far. <laughs> and so in March, they did officially let me go, which was kind of a bummer because it was my first corporate experience at a college, you know? So, and then I was, you know, it was less than a year. I made 11 months at that company and I was forced to go home to Atlanta, Georgia and kind of start the job application all over again, except a little tougher because everyone was not hiring at the time. So I started applying to jobs left and right. I was like, I'm gonna get a job again. It's gonna be good. Maybe one that I'm good at could be cool. And so hundreds of, of jobs later, it was July of 2020. And I had two interviews in one day. I was pretty stoked. I was like, two interviews, I'm crushing it. And um, after the first one, I went to the second one and realized that the companies had the same PowerPoint. The only difference was they just changed the CEO name and the company name. And ultimately I was just, I was even more bummed because I was like, oh, okay, so how many companies did I apply for? Are they trying to scam me? Do they not believe in me? Like I just had a feeling that I was not gonna get a job that I could pursue or be good at or one that would take me seriously or scam me, who knows? And so after that, I went to my dad's office and I kind of ranted a little bit. I was just so frustrated. I was like, dad, I'm so sick of applying to jobs that don't take me seriously, don't see my you know, abilities. It's so frustrating. Um, I just want to be 30, financially stable, have a coffee shop on the beach. And he's like, a coffee shop? And I said, yeah, a coffee shop. You should know that I've always wanted to do this, come on. Um, and he goes, well, coffee shops are pretty expensive. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> That's why I'm not going to do it yet. Um, and so we just kind of laughed, talked about our dreams. And I went back to um, my office to apply to more jobs, naturally. Um, so after that, later that afternoon, my dad called me back into his office. He goes, hey, Ross, come check this out. I said, what you got? What are we looking at? And he showed me this picture of a guy in a green coffee trailer up north called Green Joe Coffee Truck. It was the cutest thing. And he was like, do you see this guy? Like, this is something that you could do. And I said, yeah, that is something that I could do. Um, it's, it was one fifth the cost of a coffee shop. And it was also something logistically that I could potentially figure out. So after he told me, I went back into the office and I just got started right away. So I um, made spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet, trying to figure out how much would it cost? Do I need wholesalers? Do I need, what's commercial equipment in comparison to regular equipment? Um, I have a car, will it pull a trailer? How do you get a trailer? Where does one buy a trailer? So all of these things, I just was going for it, but on you know, that day in July, I decided that you know, if no one was gonna hire me, I'm gonna hire me. So I did it. And um, from that journey, it was July to February, I just I took every book, I asked every question, I Googled every answer, I just needed to figure out how I could get this started and it was very exhausting, very difficult. And at one point I was like, is it gonna be something that I could possibly do? And in February of 2021, I was able to open my window to the public. And it was very exciting. And the reason I'm telling you this is because don't get discouraged from the path that you're on. And if you fall off of it, maybe it wasn't your path in the first place. You know, choose a different path. It might bring you to something beautiful. And so I just wanna also give you some advice that I learned along the way is that if you have that passion to start that business in the first place, don't lose that because it's the thing that's gonna keep you going. When I was halfway between my business, I could either stop or I was halfway there. I had to make the decision to keep on going. Um, and that's what I did. I kept on going, so it will be hard, but it will be worth it. And um, also make sure that you surround yourself with people who are gonna support you. Your support system is so important. 
And I'm so lucky that I have a whole menu of people that I can name my drinks after because they've been there through thick and thin and um, had the ability to like, just like, you got this, like we believe in you. And it was just such a, it's such a great feeling and to have those people by your side, it's unreal. And not just like your loved ones, also surround yourself by, you know, with other entrepreneurs that are maybe in the same avenue as you or not in the same avenue as you. As you can see, you have a whole line of entrepreneurs that are incredible and they're inspiring and they're amazing to listen to and they should keep you going. And um, one of my favorite ones locally, his name is JMO. He owns a snowball shop uh, near the FAMU campus and he posts the most motivational things. And I one that really stuck out to me, excuse me if I don't have it correctly. Um, I think it was uh, success is hard, failure is hard. Choose your heart. And that's not a one-time decision. You gotta choose your heart every single day. And that's what I've been doing since I um, opened the business. And so I'm continuing to choose that heart every single day. And now in 2023 in February, we'll have our two years. Um, thank you, yeah. Um, we'll have uh, six employees and we'll grow six fig figures um, annually. So it's very exciting. So amazing to be here with all these other entrepreneurs that are amazing as well. So thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the great presentations. Let's give them another round of applause. I would like to now, sorry, I would like to now invite Array to come back up as we're gonna do a raffle. All right, let's give one more round of applause for the seven under 30, 2022. Let's go, let's go. So, from the um, from Ray Comer and some of our style, we wanted to leave some of you guys an uh, opportunity to take a piece of Ray Comer with you. Do everyone has those tickets you got in? Got them, got them, got them. You got one. Everyone got one. You get one. You get one. Like Oprah. <laughs> okay. So what we're we gonna do? I'm gonna just shuffle this around a little bit, call the number, and you get to see what you get to take home today. So. It's going to be pretty cool. All right. On one, two, three. One, two, three. Let's see what this can be. All right. The lucky winner who has one, five, nine, seven, five, four, zero. Winner, come up here and get your prize. Come, 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 come. <laughs> <laughs> there's three pick oh my one gosh. what do you guys think red 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 so that's the first gift off of the uh, off of the board but it's two more so you know two times is sometimes a charm all right so one two three No. All right, so we have one, five, nine, seven, four, nine, zero. Winner! Another one. Another one. You just had it. All right, pick your one. Pick, pick, pick one. You just put it there. I like this one. All right, that's one. Yeah, cool. All right, we're going to save the best for last. So we have one more gift here in our gift suite. So one, two, three. If it's her number, One more time, one more time. One five nine seven five two one. No? Oh, well, another one must go on. Going once, going twice. All right, another one. Okay. One, two, three. All right. One five nine seven four sixty nine. Hey! We got 
are the last winner. Are you lucky or are you what? Very Here you go. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite back up Dubois. All right. Hey, everybody again. How y'all feeling? Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Take a stretch. I know you've been sitting. Maybe you need to wiggle around a little bit. Take a deep breath. Bend your knees. Reach up to the sky. I'm a, I'm, I was a dancer, you know. Yeah, roll your shoulders back, roll them forward. If you need to take a walk around the room, do what you need to do. Just shake up the energy. Okay, cool. You can have a seat. All right. Um, cool. So we have, um, in the same spirit, uh, three of the books that I talked about, Think, I Am Whatever I Think, a uh, beautiful coffee table book my wife and I wrote. So I have three of those to give away. And then I want to tell you a little bit about this brand, Vitae London is a beautiful watch brand. So we have a small face watch and then a large face watch that we'll raffle off. Um, but Vitae London, what's beautiful about these watches is that with each purchase of a watch, um, you help to fund a year's worth of education for a South Saharan African student. Um, my buddy Will Adwasi um, and his wife, Claudia uh, founded this brand, um, and yeah, it's just really special to us. We helped uh, facilitate and broker that relationship and got them into 39 Nordstrom stores through our King brand across the nation, as well as in Macy's. So Vitae and then and then the books. So we're going to do the route, and, and uh, Ravi should actually come up and do this, because he's a much better um, like uh, facilitator and stuff, so I'm just putting him on the spot in case he wants to come take the mic. Otherwise, I will... I will call it out. Um, all right, so we have one five nine seven four seven seven for a book. One five nine. All right, let's go. And each copy is signed by my wife and I. Congratulations! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, I wish I were taller. There you go. Very nice. Thank you. What's your name? Jake. Jake. Nice to meet you. Yes. All right, let's do another one. Let's get through this because there's some incredible questions I know from the audience, and I want to hear these guys speak because I'm taking notes as well. All right, 159 for a book, 7485. 159, 7485. Let's go! Very nice. And your name? Tony. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One more for the book, and then we'll get to the big shebang. I know I saw people's eyes with the watches. They're like, get over with the books. Um, I want to watch. All right. One, five, nine, seven, four, nine, four. <laughs> one, five, nine, seven, four, nine, four. Going once, going twice. And another one bites the dust. All right. One, five, nine, seven, four, eight, three. Okay. Let's go. House right. What's your name? Sana. Sana? Nice to meet Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. All right. Now for the watches. Yes. All right. I'm gonna let the the dean pick this as well, so no pressure on me. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. All right. This is one five nine seven four seven zero. Let's go! Congratulations. All right. Here you go. No. Congratulations. And then finally, this is for the big face uh, watch. One last one. We have one five nine seven four nine six. One five nine seven four. Let's go. Let's give him a round of applause. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, thank you. Thank you both so much for the wonderful raffle and giveaway. Um, I would like to invite you all back on the stage for some Q&A. So our seven, please come on back. Make yourself comfortable.
Can I sit in the middle here? Me? You don't think I should sit between them? I kind of like this here. This is nice. This is nice. Remember, if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah, did you guys turn your mics back on? Good. Testing. Can you hear us? Hello? Testing. Go. There it is. Remember, if you have any questions, you can tweet us at hashtag 7 under 30, and we'll be happy to um, read those out and answer those questions for you. But I'm going to actually start it off, and um, feel free to um, answer if you feel so compelled to do so. Um, how do you all create a work-life balance? Is it difficult? And how do you manage it as an entrepreneur? Anyone like to take this one? Um, yeah. All right, Sean? Yeah, I think it's, it's totally possible. Um, there's... You know, entrepreneurship really becomes part of your lifestyle, um, so it, it can be very intertwined. Also, like you're the boss, so if you if you need more balance, then create it for yourself. Sometimes there will be demanding things that um, you know take up a lot of your time, and and it's a constant balance. But I think you can get a lot done. It's it's really about being intentional in the time that you're working. Make sure you're putting in good work. Make sure you're not wasting those moments. And then being intentional with your personal time too. Make sure you're spending time with the people you care about, doing the things you love to do, and not wasting time on that end as well. Absolutely. Can I add something? Yes, Ravi. I've dealt with this quite a bit as well. I think uh, I I won't steal this. Somebody else told me this, but they said there, there's no such thing as work-life balance. Uh, instead seek for work-life harmony. And that is what I've done. And I still see friends of mine that are in relationships and it, their girlfriend or boyfriend's like, oh, it's Friday, like stop working, or we're on vacation, stop working. And, and as uh, obviously these talented people have said, in reality, it's gonna be 40, 60, 70, 80 hours uh, work week. And you really shouldn't be around people or environments that would make you feel bad for working. At least that's what I consider in my opinion. Mm -hmm. and and so you should be around people who support you and want you to succeed because that's going to typically require a lot of work. And I've been fortunate enough to kind of build a, an environment and friends of mine where we could go on vacation somewhere, but everyone's working while we're on vacation. We're just in a new place to do it. And so I think that they're... they're they're not diametric. It's not like you have to have two different ends to it. And if you always seek to have it balanced, I think it would be almost impossible to do. So instead, seek to create an environment where they're harmonized together. And I think you'll find uh, more happiness doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to invite the audience to ask any questions. Um, you guys were able to hear all the presentations today. Is there anything that stood out? Would love to hear from you all. Yes, if you don't mind coming up to the mic, please. <laughs> Didn't tell him that Thank beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, do any of you guys ever feel unmotivated or burnt out? And if so, how do you deal with that? Who wants to take this one? Yeah. Well, I think it. Um, so sometimes when you're continuing to work on this project, you get extremely tired and I think some of the easiest things that you, that you can do in entrepreneurship is learn when to take a break just it's okay to pause if you cut your business off for a week I promise you next week it will still build your business learn when it's okay to take a vacation like for example um, a couple weeks from now I'm going to LA solely just for vacation solely just for inspiration I'm not bringing my uh, work phone I'm not bringing anything that I need but as far as business, because I want to take that break, because if you continue to run that treadmill, you're gonna eventually fall off the treadmill, and it's gonna be worse if you just would've just got off for just a couple minutes or a couple days, that makes sense. Thank you, Array. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on that too. Um, I think it's really important to um, try and find, um, you know, little wins that you can try and hit. Um, Consistently, that you know will keep you motivated because yeah, you know, it's it's it, you, you get that you know sense of accomplishment and motivation you know from getting things done. Um, at least I do, and and being able to um, you know find success in yourself through um, you know achieving smaller goals that motivate you to 
either get through waiting to hear back about a big goal or motivate you to apply to a big goal. Like we deal with writing a lot of grants and, and those take like nine months to hear back from. And, and, and so like it's very hard to wait and um, wait for those things. And so you kind of have to like do that, forget about that and like move on to the next thing. And, and in that time, you know, finding those little wins to keep you motivated um, and not feel burnt out um, is, is, I think, is really critical. Um, so if you can identify those and, and do those, I think it'll help you keep your motivation up and um, get through you know, any waiting if you're waiting for something bigger. So. Thank you, John. I'm going to pass it over to Kaylee, who has our tweet questions. Hi, everyone. Um, so here on Twitter, we have someone asking, how do you continue to follow your own dreams when others have the same or similar interest? Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, I, oh, no, please. No, you got it. No, please. Oh. <laughs> no, well, I was just going to say, like, I am in the coffee industry, and if you're familiar with it, it's very saturated. <laughs> um, but no one is ever going to, you know, be your business. And that's the cool thing that I love about marketing is it's how you tell your story and how you connect with your audience. Someone's always going to connect with you on what you're saying and how they relate to you. And so it's never going to be a duplicate of someone else. You've got to keep that in mind, especially when you're comparing yourself to someone. Because in reality, I mean, it's great to keep tabs on people. I do that, sure. But comparing yourself can only take you so far. Um, don't let it control who you are and who you want your brand to be because ultimately it's yours and it's how you portray it and you shouldn't be distracted by what else, what someone else is doing. Thank you, Roz. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say something similar. The last point in the, in the speech I said was never underestimate your perspective, never underestimate your point of view. I think that, again, that translates to this, uh, to, to this thought, which is, you are you, what you are building, even if it's similar or in the same industry or in the same market, um, what you're doing is, is unique. And so you have to just be clear about your value pro proposition, which is so like businessy, but be clear about your why, be clear about what makes what you're doing differently. There are, especially in New York City, every third person walking is an agency like can oh every third every second person walking is a consultant easy <laughs> easy they're consulting about something mm -hmm. and so you can feel like well everybody's a consultant what does that even mean you know but if you have a point of view or perspective lean into that let that be your driver let and, and let that be clear um, so then it's not about what other people are doing. And if you're doing something great, most of the time there are some other people doing something in that, that realm. That means it's a, a good place to occupy. So. Thank, you. Thank you. One more time. Um, so chiming on both of their both responses, and me being in such of a, a unique industry, I believe that people don't buy the product, they buy the person they're buying from. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're being able to be relatable and have their own special report or have a... Um, a business uh, story that they can relate to and that they like, it doesn't really matter if he sells this and you sell this across the street. And that's why I was saying. On top of that too, people can tell when you're passionate about your product and you're selling something that you believe in too. Yeah. So as long as you have a product that you believe in and you're selling something that you feel strongly about, other people will be able to see that as well. Yeah. Thank Passion you. never lies. Thank you, guys. Um, I want to take it back to the audience. Do you guys have any more questions? Yes. <laughs> so impressed. You guys are amazing <clears throat> for sharing your story. Entrepreneurship is a story. What, if you're courageous enough to answer this question, has been this, is the most single most gratifying aspect? your journey in entrepreneurship, and I wonder if it's connected to your purpose. Mm. Wow. Who's going to take that one? <laughs> Heavy question. <laughs> I can be short with that and then tag I know some other people. For me, it's been doing it with my wife. Um, mm. we, we build a lot together. Um, you know, and, and some people are like, never work with your spouse. <laughs> you know? um, but 
you know, we've been married almost eight years. We have a daughter, and, and we're really fortunate to do it together. Um, and we try to, even in moments where it's like, oh, you know, we have other interests. We, we're we always pulling each other into the projects that are happening over here. Like, oh, I'm starting another company over here. She's starting another company over here, which is separate from our main thing um, or what was our main thing for a while. So I would say that. And I think that that's deeply connected to my pur purpose because I believe that beyond everything that I do well, artists, all these things, um, being a husband and a father, I really do believe I was put on this earth to do that. Yes, yes. And so the businesses and all that stuff is just um, a means for me to better be a husband and a father um, and provide and, and be a protector, et cetera. So, yeah. I'll, I'll add on to it. If, yeah. um, for me, our mission statement is helping life-changing businesses through simple, scalable systems. And so one of the cool things that I do is that we help other companies grow and scale through multiple different methods and, and mediums. And so even if, for, for example, I didn't have the most life-changing business, if, for example, many of these people do have life-changing businesses, if I help them acquire more customers and impact more people in a sense, it's because I was able to do that for them. And so it's like, whatever their mission is becomes my mission. And so we have able to help a lot of really amazing people. And I think the other side of it is also, you know, once you start amassing capital, kind of like some people here were talking about investing and, um, and also like I understand, uh, as we all do, the difficulties of when you're first starting out. And so one of my favorite things to do is just like support either local businesses or support entrepreneurs that are just starting out. And it's very difficult when you don't have any money in the very beginning. But as you start to amass it, I think giving back, but I'm a big fan of capitalism. So giving back in a way that is like you're doing a great business and a great service and I want to pay you for that instead of asking for a discount. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so I know you're a remote first business, Harvey, and so I know one of the common struggles right now for small businesses is getting people to, to work for you, you know, hiring people right now. And so for an early stage entrepreneur, how do you convince people to work for you if you're a brand new company? Um, how do you get new team members on board if you have 47 team members? How do you keep that brand culture intact as well? Yeah, great question. So, at least in my experience, your culture is a direct representation of who you are. And I think a lot of people use the word mission or values, but a lot of people don't have them actually written down. Mm -hmm. And business, as many of them have said, is, is really a long game. So, I think the first thing you decide is, uh, he's fortunate enough to work with his wife, um, and you have to realize that the people that you're going to be working with are going to be like your work wife, if you've ever heard that, or your work husband. Mm -hmm. And so choosing the right people has more of an impact than probably anything you could do on marketing or sales or anything else along those lines. And so it is very serious when you're starting to get intentional about hiring team members and spending a lot. I used to just hire because they were the cheapest. Um, and now that we're at where we're at, I understand the importance of it. But I think the biggest lesson for me was having a mission that was so big and so strong and then like you as the CEO living that mission every single day and like you know staying late quote unquote you know until the lights turn out and being the values that you propagate elsewhere and I think when they were talking about the competition thing earlier I have this maybe um I won't say depressing the thought, but I think most businesses are, are really not great at it. Like most business owners shouldn't be business owners in my experience because they don't really run a great business. And so I think that you think that there's all this competition out there and people can go work a lot of other places, but if you really build an amazing company, it's actually really easy to attract talented, talented people. So I guess my recommendation would be to work on you first and that in turn will attract the most qualified and amazing people to come um, work for your business because they essentially want to work with you. Thank you. We're going to head back over to Twitter with Miss Kaylee. Yes. Um, so I have two questions that are somewhat similar, so I'll ask them both at the same time. Um, what was your most pivotal moment within your business, and what was your I made it moment? I'll, I, I guess I'll take the pivotal moment was because we're still on this topic of team. Uh, it's, uh, gosh, a team for a business is so critical. Yeah. Um, and it's often so hard to find co-founders and employees. So when we were at FSU, when we, the original four guys for Diatech, um, that was such a pivotal moment for us because it was one, super great, because 
we pride ourselves in, in that every member of our, our company has a connection to diabetes. Um, and you know, we're very proud of that. Um, and so it was just amazing to be able to finally get a team together and, and delegate and get stuff done. Because it can be very hard to be a solo founder. Um, and so that moment, I would say, was probably the most pivotal for us. And you know, sourcing employees, if you're, if you're trying to get that, or sourcing co-founders can be extremely difficult. Of course, you have your network here at this university. Um, there are resources um, you know, nationally and different entrepreneurial networks to, to connect with um, you know, fo other founders if you're trying to start companies or hire people who are interested in working for startups. Um, so there are resources out there. Again, if anyone's interested, we can talk about that after. Um, but in regards to the made it moment, I don't, I mean, I don't know, maybe <laughs> selling a company isn't a made it moment, but if you're still working on a startup, you know, typically that that moment still is over the horizon or you're always working for that. Um, but I mean, the moment that we felt really validated um, was, you know, when we're having conversations with, you know, moms of children with type 1 diabetes or people with type 1 diabetes that, you know, your product is making a difference for us. Mm -hmm. And when you can have those conversations with people who are your customers, who validate you, um, validate your path, what you're building, um, and you know truly from them <laughs> that what you're making is solving their problem, that is literally the most validating moment for a business. Um, not only for yourself, but also to know, like, okay, like, I might make money off of this, right? Like, this is going to actually work. Yeah. But personally, like, that's also extremely, extremely yeah. validating, valuable, um, the made it moment. Um, so that, I agree with that immensely. Thank you, John. Anybody else want to answer that pivotal moment question? Yeah, I think that feeling like having multiple businesses is perpetual. Um, you know, each time I've had a new product and one of them's more of a service, um, when somebody loves what you created from what was just an idea in your head and they decide to purchase it from you and they use it and they love it, um, that is definitely like, I think the, the ultimate high in business and, um, you know, if you have a, a product that people buy every day, you feel that constantly, and you kind of need that constant reminder and, um, you know, high to, to push you through all of the, the difficulties that are running a business. I think a pivotal moment for my business, um, kind of smaller scale, uh, but it was actually very recent. It was in September. So I originally started this company by myself, you know, so I was in the trailer 24 seven making coffee for people. Um, and I hired my first employee, I think three months after I opened. And since then I had been in the trailer with each shift. I was always there. Um, and then in September, it was just getting to the point where the business was growing so much. I was neglecting emails. I was neglecting like the efficiency of the business because I always had to be there. Um, and I had to make the decision to have enough employees, um, kind of make that financial sacrifice and also the logistical sacrifice of me not being there, trust these people uh, to run the business without me being there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really hard because I feel like my trailer is like my little baby. <laughs> he has a name and everything, I swear. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so it was like really hard for me to leave him. It's like I was dropping him off at school, you know, for the first day. Um, and but now it's been like two months and I'm so proud of my team. I, they do an exceptional job. So it, it makes me just love my team more. And it's so cool to see that my business can run efficiently without me not having to be there all the time. And then I can also optimize other aspects of it. So very pivotal and also kind of a made it moment if I can tag team that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, this question might sound a little vague at first, but I'm going to try to explain it. Um, how do you know what to go for? Because I know that you guys are all entrepreneurs and you probably have tons of different ideas. And like even with like coffee or boutiques and stuff, how do you know which one to go for and to risk everything for? And... Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a good question. People ask this usually all the time. It's like very common. And I think definitely if you're entrepreneurial, you will have endless ideas, um, at least I do. And at a point, like you just have to pick something. Um, I think there's 
as you like mature as an entrepreneur, you became you become really good at auditing your ideas. So you'll have an idea and you'll kind of put this through your your process of is this worth doing and that'll require a lot of things. Um, but when you're just starting, I think either something, go for the thing you're most passionate about, if it's a space, um, you know, if it's an industry, if it's a type of product that's just like calling your name, even if that space seems busy, go for that for sure. But if you're unsure and you're just really passionate about being an entrepreneur, then just pick anything because just look at stuff you use on a daily basis, pick one of those or something that seems kind of fun and go for it and that'll, you know, give you so much experience and then you'll learn from there. Yeah, I'll also quickly just say that I think, like, so, again, shouting out Domi, because that was a critical point, part, uh, you know, part of this ecosystem that helped, helped us build. They, they really advertised um, customer discovery, right? And I'm sure you all learn about this in your classes. Um, you know, you can literally form, like, spreadsheets, right, of a list of people who you can talk to about your idea or product. And, you know, again, these are the people who are going to be paying for your thing. And if early on you are having 30 minute interviews or 15 minute conversations or whatever with these, this, this group of people, and they're like, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd probably not buy that. Then maybe like that's a sign to consider like this might not be something that you would want to sell, right? But if you are having impactful conversations with these people, it's validating. Um, that I think is like the first you know, pass for you to move on to um, the next step, which there's, it could be anything really. I mean, there's, there's a kind of a uh, algorithm you can follow for starting a business, but I would say definitely customer discovery is that first one, having those real conversations, recording that data. Uh, but again, I'm a STEM guy, so I <laughs> kind of get too caught up in that, the weeds sometimes with that stuff. I'll also add that my favorite quote is, action leads to insight more often than insight leads to action, which essentially means that by thinking about, is this the best thing, or is that the best thing, or that's the best thing, you'll literally never know until you actually do the thing, and then you could say, that was a terrible idea. But at least now you know that that was a terrible idea. And so just getting started, you know, as I, when I got up there and talked about like the first few businesses that I started, I think... Like I have a lot of respect for some people here who like started the, the, the coffee shop and started the boutique because that requires a lot of up, upfront capital, which is you're making a big bet on yourself. And they have more confidence in themselves than I did, I think, when I first started. And so like even if you are looking at opportunities, I think the customer like avatar interviewing people is a great idea. But I also think that uh, if you can choose a business first that doesn't require a whole lot of capital outlay, like a lot of cash up front, yeah. because there's a good chance you're going to fail, in all honesty. And it's nice when you don't have like a huge graveyard of debt behind you. Um, but if you can t test that and iterate that a few times, you'll eventually come to something that's really, really great. I also think too, if you look at your list of ideas maybe and kind of find something that you may have a unique take on to bring to the market, then maybe that is the one that you need to go to because you're gonna stand out more than anybody else. When we opened our store in Tallahassee, there was nothing exactly like us. We're very, uh, pink, southern, bright, you know, all those fun things. And there was nothing that quite had what we wanted to bring to the table. So look through your list of ideas, really work them out, see if you could bring something unique to the table. And then my husband's in the audience right now. He's an entrepreneur as well. We've had many ideas at the dinner table, you know, of things we could open. And we look at them and we're like, you know what, that would be cool, but that's not going to work for us. So really just work them through and be smart about the ideas that you want to open to. Oh, go ahead, please. You sure? Oh, right. yeah, I'll go, I'll go after you. Just please. Okay. I, I, I was going to say, um, to make it a little cheesy in here, um, passion is also really important because you're going to have to advocate this product slash business wherever you are. And if you're not passionate about it, you're going to have a hard time selling it. Like when I was in my sales position, I was selling supply chain logistics. What? <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> exactly. So when I was selling it, I, I was so disconnected from it, and I didn't want to sell that. It was hard for me to be personal about, personal about it, tell my story about it, and ultimately I couldn't connect with people, and that's why it didn't work out for me. Um, but with like coffee, I just I'm so passionate about it, and I have a story to tell, and I try to connect with people on that on that aspect. So just remember when you do start your business that you are going to have to advocate that, you're going to have to tell your story with it, and you know you got to push for it. So I recommend passion. Mm -hmm. I'll just quickly say again, because I don't want to speak too much, but getting a business started requires capital and time. Mm -hmm. um, and so as students um, who are going to be entering the workforce with your own companies, there are resources for you to incur capital without the need of debt or sharks or venture funding, which to be honest, like 
can be debilitating if you yeah. fail. And so there's enough capital, I think, that you can raise through student competitions, local grants, state grants, even federal grants that you can go for. Blackstone Launchpad. Yes, and, and they are, they, and I encourage you guys to check these out because they are non-dilutive, meaning they don't take equity yeah. in the company, and you can raise 50 to $200,000 um, which can be impactful for you without somebody even, you know, uh, you know, hope, like being like calling you up every quarter, being like, "Hey, where's my investment?" I mean, blah 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 blah. So, again, there are those resources out there, um, and these people in this room can help you acquire those. So my question is for Lauren. I also really want to start a team. Like that's like my biggest dream and goal in life. So what's like the hardest thing that was like starting your boutique or like just running it? Like what's like your biggest obstacle, hardest thing you can keep running into? Oh gosh. Um, I honestly think the hardest thing was just taking the jump and doing it. If you really believe in yourself and Literally everybody in my family wanted me to start my store before I did because I was like, no, like I want to be safe. I don't want to risk any money. I don't want to do this or that. But if I had started it sooner, I would probably be even further along than I am today. Um, so just believing in yourself to start that business is really the biggest thing. And I know it takes a lot more money, but I would say the brick and mortar, like that small town feel has been so, so helpful to me. There are lots of online boutiques. There are a lot of boutiques, to be honest with you, but there are lots of online boutiques right now. But getting to have that customer interaction face-to-face -face every day, having the good people in your store, whether it's you or your employees, our biggest thing is customer customer service. So I own the store with my mom. Obviously, we're family. When we hire girls, we look to say, like, you're going to become part of our family. Like, that's what we're looking for. We can teach you to run a register. We can teach you to do whatever you need to do in the store. But we can't teach you to be kind to people. We can't teach you to be helpful to people. And that is what people really appreciate when they walk into our doors because they feel like they're part of our family when they walk in. So I feel like just keep that mindset in mind and just jump and do it and start because if you don't, then you're always going to wonder what if, what if. Don't let it just be a dream. Just act on it and start. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Kaylee, do you have any more questions from Twitter? Twitter. Sorry, I was waiting for green. Um, do you have any books or podcasts that you may recommend that would influence your or their entrepreneurial journey? So many books. <laughs> well, I think, Email me and I'll send you a list. Um, no, yeah. I, I mean, this probably, it depends on, it depends on what you want to do, but I, there, there are some books that I've read by people that I don't love as people, but their books are really good. So I want to preface this by saying that. Uh, mm -hmm. One is the, the 10X rule. Um, um, no, no shade to Grant Cardone. Actually, Grant, let's hang out. Um, but the book itself, the premise of the book in terms of like a, a, just a paradigm shifting thinking, um, you know, the ability to say, hey, whatever I'm doing, I can scale this to do more. I can, I think I'm working really hard but I can work harder. I, I think I'm putting in a lot of hours. There's more time to, to put in. Um, so that one, another book I was actually telling Ravi about, um, which is not necessarily business related, but I think is a, a principle that's transferable. I'm huge on uh, principle um, as a kind of driving force, but Relational Intelligence by Dr. Dar Darius Daniels. Um, huge, huge, just like mind boggling book about um, rela relationality, having a relational IQ, um, and being able to deal with people, which gets to customer service and part building. I work a lot in partnership development, and when you're brokering deals, it's a very emotional, it can be at least, a very emotional process. Um, so knowing how to work with people, learn, learning how people uh, tick, you know, what are people's needs, what are the primal desires of a, a human being, and how you can cater to those things. Um, so yeah, relational intelligence, 10x rule, and there's like a uh, hundred more that I could um, say. But and I think two, uh, I think one of them that I really love that I think any uh, business can use, either if it's online or under the service, is um, how to win friends and influence others uh, by Dale Carnegie. Uh, I think it's a book that kind of takes the selfishness of off of you and learning how to service others, uh, learning how to basically saying, hey. It's not what I want. What does that customer want? And I think if you understand what the customer wants, 
that can take you further than any of your selfish desires uh, in business. So that's good. I keep up, but I think that's the number one book. Anybody in this room, and it's not just about business. It's just about how to treat others, how to be better friends, how to be better uh, family members. And I think that book is very uh, transparent across every aspect of life. So give it a read for sure. Do you guys know those books that are like yellow that have that character? It's the Four Dummies book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Angel Investing or Early Stage Investing for Dummies is such a good book. Um, it's like so so like the concept of dilution in companies, um, raising capital because. Some people may not do that, but you know, again, acquiring investment might be critical for your business. You know, understanding all of the, the science to um, you know, dilution in a company and equity and raising funds and projecting out valuations for companies. Um, it can be really, really scary and like almost calculus language. And so uh, that type of book, there's a couple other ones that like that that can really make that an easier topic to understand. And I highly recommend um, that type of book, um, whether or not you plan to raise dilutive capital, just because it, again, teaches you the ins and outs of, um, of management when it comes to funding and even fun uh, management of revenue. Um, so yeah. I highly recommend one of those. Thank you, guys. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yeah. I just want to start off by thanking all of you for being uh, coming out here tonight, just like, being able to host this for everybody and be a part of it. My name is Gabriel Mastachulo. I'm a senior here with the JNC. Um, I co-founded a business called Heidi Rug. We make handmade tough to decor. It was um, two, about two years ago this coming February. And I just want to ask, if this is more so for John, it's kind of give me that. Um, where would you, what would you recommend to a company that's a like small startup that you know, bootstrapped a lot, did a little bit of grants through like schools and school products? What would you recommend for us, like if we wanted to, or anybody who wanted to, like go to the next step when it comes to like grant work or getting funding? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, oh man, I'm I'm really gonna try and say because again, all my perspective is kind of in the STEM side. So, isn't ICOR general? Is it is it specific to science? Bill. Yes. Thank you. It is specific <laughs> to science. Ah, oh, dang. Well. Um, yeah, the, in regards to, you know, the next step of, of, of funding, um, I think when it comes to you getting grants, uh, I would have to, as a non-STEM expert, I'd have to defer that question again to probably like Domi or um, experts that could help you with that. Um, but it does exist. Um, I know, you know, there's a lot of resources here uh, within the state of Florida. Um, so I'm sorry that I can't answer that outside of the STEM, but um, I, I'm, I know that they can, they can definitely help you. I can direct you to that resource. So, right here. Um, and it, I'm sorry, was there another part to your question? No. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry. Well, if anybody else wants to take that, like anybody else mm -hmm. with funding work. I, I'll just speak sh shortly about it. I think um, positioning of your brand is super huge at this stage, like how you're positioned in terms of having the right packaging that would be appealing to the types of funders. Also understanding that there are different types of funders, um, different VC firms that are interested in uh, specifically what you're doing, you know, so like if you're looking at their portfolio and they have all STEM stuff, they may not be interested in tufted things, you know what I mean? So, and that's like obvious, but sometimes it can be like, oh, trivial. So do, doing that work, knowing the reality is that with funding, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. So you want to know as much as you can about why they started the VC firm, who their partners are, why, what, are their, what is their portfolio build out look like. And then you can, knowing that, you can even be strategic, strategic to say, oh, they don't have anything like this in their portfolio, but I can potentially reposition to fit and be an outlier 
or they don't have anything like this in their portfolio, they're never gonna have anything like this in their portfolio. I'm gonna go this, this way. So I would say positioning, which gets back to storytelling, um, knowing what are the value proposition, what's the value proposition for your company, uh, where it might best fit in the marketplace, like really being um, tedious about that and, and how you position and tell that story for the right funders, I think it's, a, it's just a great step for where you are. Yeah. yeah, another good strategy, of course, is just to, like, um, we did this often, sourcing um, successful either M&As or uh, people within the business in your realm um, and, you know, potentially seeking them as angel investors. Um, that's, that's something that we've done, at least within the, the med tech space, for people who've exited with uh, device companies and stuff. So um, if you have that network, you know, getting in touch with those people, that's a lot easier said than done. But, um, yeah. Um, I, I feel I feel bad because I'm talking about investment resources. I'm not able to provide any for you for your business, but um, uh, we can. Uh, I'd love to follow up after and definitely explore those options. Uh, so we have a rolodex of different angel groups here, at least in Florida, that we've talked to that are not specific to med tech. Um, that may find your business really intriguing. So. Thank you guys so much for your questions. Audience, our people on Twitter. Um, now, on behalf of Jim Moran College, we would like to present you guys with some gifts, and thank you so much for being with us today. Shame to give something from Starbucks when we have Rosalind here. <laughs> but this is for Caitlin. Caitlin, still back there working hard. I know you love coffee too, and um, you get a little, yeah, <laughs> you get a gift too, so I'll put it up here for you. So um, thank you all for this great panel and for coming here. Um, most of you traveled, a couple of you local, and um, thank you very much for taking your time and, and traveling here and being here. And it's interesting questions, interesting insights. So, and I know it's inspirational for students to see young people like you that, and what you're doing, and not that long after you graduated from FSU. So, it's exciting, and I know you all have bright futures ahead, so we want to keep in touch. Um, there's some Tallahassee Startup Week. Thank Robert's here, Julia from Domi, and there's Kara. So they've been really working hard this week to organize a lot of activities and things. So we hope you will participate in some of the other things that as the week finishes up. They've had, this is the third day. I'm surprised you're still standing, but thank you for being, <laughs> thank you for being here and all of your organizing. And please check our website. Um, John mentioned thank you Innovation Challenge. You guys, please participate in that. All you students, you can win money. You can win $10,000. And that's, that? like you said, that's non-dilutive. That's money to help you grow your business, start your business, grow your business. We have micro grants up to $5,000. So there's a lot of money to be had. And, you know, we don't just throw out the money. We give you advice and mentoring and stuff, too, to help you to um, so where you can grow it and do things with it. So uh, check our website. Morgan's in the um, Sprout at Shaw as a resource to let you know. And Caitlin also in Shaw, and I'm in this building, so we want to be available to help you. Um, the business model competition, the deadline to apply isn't until January this year, so you still have time to get involved with that. And so there's a quick changeover, so kind of be patient while social catering comes in and works their magic and turns the back of this into a reception area. And stick around so you can talk to the panelists and um, you know further ask any questions you might have and just have some networking time. So thank you for being here, and thank you all especially for being here.